Welcome to the Concept 101 podcast. My name is Daniel. Jules. Stefan. We're three concept artists currently working in the film and games industry, as well as the organizers of the Concept 101 event in London. And today we're going to be talking to you all about the life cycle of a professional project. So myself, Jules and Stefan have been very lucky in our short careers to see the uh, kind of birth and completion of multiple projects um, at different stages, jumping on at different points. Um, but we've all been able to kind of see through, you know, what happens over the potentially often like many, many years sometimes for some projects, yeah. how they go from, you know, start to completion, which yeah. has been amazing. So we thought with regards to that, it'd be great to jump in and talk about the different types of work that you often have to do during these different stages, the different skill sets that are required and how that also differs between films and games, which we all obviously have experience mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Awesome. See, so, yeah, I guess we're going to, I can start with the the film and TV type of stuff. So usually when a, a director or someone else has an idea of how to make a movie, they kind of get a few writers, a very small team of just friends, I assume, and they're like, okay, great. I have this great idea of a dinosaur movie. So we just need to find funding for it. We just need to make it work. So how do they get the funding? How do they present it to like Netflix or Disney other people? Well, they need to work on a pitch And this pitch needs to get some artworks in there because that's the sexy stuff. That's how you kind of, I guess, get people excited about the movie, you know? And so this is what is usually considered, at least with, to my experience, as pitch work. So directors and their team, maybe a production designer at that, day, at that stage, they would reach out to us and they would be, great, we have this amazing idea about this dinosaur movie, which has a flying dinosaur. Uh, who is doing a backflip <laughs> but to sell it to Disney or to anyone else will have to make a visual of that and then we're going to work with them for like a few weeks maybe a few days maybe a few months on how to create the pitch work uh, sorry a pitch document yeah, yeah a pitch deck. deck a pitch deck, that's pitch it. deck yeah. and uh, that's going to be useful for them to then go and get funding mm. generally that early stage pitch work is very rough which mm -hmm. also makes it some of the most fun stuff to do. Mm -hmm. It's also generally speaking, some of the more highly paid stuff in the industry to do if you're doing it from a freelance perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'll find a lot of the really, really experienced artists who work in the film industry, that's often what they go on to. They'll jump onto like multiple pitches per year, working uh, very closely with directors, which also comes in part, I think, with mm -hmm. why it's quite well paid generally, because mm -hmm. you're working much more closely with directors than usual. Um, But the goal is really often with that pitch work for film to just get the mood and the idea of the script and project out rather than anything super specific. Um, it's very rare actually that concepts from a pitch kind of travel the whole way through to the end of the production. Yeah. Um, but it is a super fun stage to jump in at. I just want to ask when you do this kind of pitch work and you deal with the clients, it could be the directors or something, uh, something like that, do they always have to be famous directors? Like, just curious. Or like, would this even be someone who doesn't have necessarily a name, but they're trying to build their name, they would come to, you know... Well, I think it, it, at where we are working right now and my, with my experience, it depends as to, of the budget they have, right? Because um, same, if you're a freelance artist, if you want to work for free for someone who doesn't have money and is not famous, then it's your choice. Yeah, Usually people who get in the situation of being able to afford concept artist or an art department, they have either a background which uh, makes them trustworthy of working for them yeah. or they and they already have some sort of uh, funding to a sm very small scale to which they can just kickstart the project. Right? Yeah, yeah. So um, it happened to me that I worked uh, for like some smaller Uh, directors, but still established peoples, they, they might not be the, you know, the Spielberg, <laughs> but they're still very established um, in, in their own field. So, yeah, but that's that's working within a department, I guess, and as a freelance, it's up to you. If you, if I guess someone reached out to you and you feel like you have enough money to work for very cheap or for free, then I guess you can work for whoever you want, if it is a very exciting project. The advantageous thing about jumping onto a project at pitch point is that usually people, both whether it's like vendors or freelancers, are often doing it to potentially get more work down the road. Mm -hmm. It's usually a very, very short turnaround of stuff. So you might only work on a pitch for, say, two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, if that means that you then get to crack down on over a year of work after that point because it helps the film get approved and then you have good relationship with whoever did it, 
it's very much worth it. Yeah. Um, I think it's it it is a very interesting thing as well because generally speaking, a lot of pitch work I think is what we would associate with uh, kind of like classic concept art, maybe like the kind of concept art even that people were making like ten years ago. Where it's just like a lot looser and a lot rougher. Yeah. Um, it's more artsy. Like you could, yeah. do, it's like a lot of photo bashing. Not more, you know, like you don't need to go crazy in 3D because you don't have the, that much time anyway. And you don't have the assets that a whole department has been working on for like two years. Um, but yeah, I, I think the reason why so many freelancers and famous freelancers go towards pitch is because it is the, the quintessence, yes, I'm saying this word, of concept art, which just means like, raw fun and the biggest impact that anyone can have on the project because you know you might have an idea of oh what if the dinosaur who's flying is actually not a dinosaur and it's a man and the director goes like <laughs> great idea <laughs> then maybe you just they change the brief for you you know that's pretty sick yeah. um it might not happen but if it does happen that's like pretty cool that you can have such a big impact and you're part of the conversation and you're working directly with directors hmm, which tends not to happen that much down the line in the production yeah. The other thing to say, though, is that with pitch work, if you do it, it is also the most likely to end there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, pitch work, especially in films, often can go just nowhere, um, which can be very disappointing, obviously, but it kind of is what it is. Um, so, a lot, yeah, a lot of pitch stuff will go. The directors will look at it. They'll love it. Maybe whatever producers are directly around them will love it. And then it will go to whoever is actually trying to fund the film mm -hmm. and they will just say, nah, we're good. And they pull it <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it just doesn't go beyond that point, which is always a massive shame. But I think people would be surprised how many pictures essentially get pushed out to these studios before um, anybody even says anything yeah. that, that greenlights it essentially. Yeah, and some projects also, I mean, being in industry, you kind of hear about some names of projects which have been around for like 10 years, 15 years, and they keep being pitched, uh, pitched, pitched, and they keep being like brought forwards, but then it's always dropped and it's like, oh, wow, it's like, there it was a, a There was a pitch I worked on um, when I started in the industry. And the day I started on it, uh, my boss at the time pulled out this old like library of work on his computer and he went, oh yeah, I worked on this. And I went, oh, no, no way, how long ago? And he went, 11 years <laughs> and it was because one company had owned the rights to this ip for like 15 years and it was finally doing the cycles again and um <laughs> it's funny i've actually seen that ip thrown out like in in just in my career like multiple times yeah. like not necessarily always me working on it but i've always heard oh this person's working on it or this person's mm. working on it and yeah a lot of these things go through like like literally just churn through directors and uh, cast essentially yeah. on a constant basis and some of them just never get made uh yeah but i imagine some of them will get made eventually it's just like yeah. you always uh i mean i mean maybe always, <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean you always look for something fresh and nowadays there isn't that many new fresh ideas i think people are potentially looking for something new rather than just yeah. like the avengers number 15 mm -hmm. movie at the end of the day you know it's like a pitch very cheap to make going forward with a pitch making a movie insanely expensive to make and very risky so a lot of them have to go away i guess this is probably a nice segue as well to what's the equivalent to pitch in video game what's the equivalent to early uh, ideation in video games and because i i assume that a lot of them get pitched in the same ways and then get cancelled yeah so i so I, what i've heard uh, a lot of the pitches do get cancelled uh um in games mm -hmm. especially yeah, like the early stage in fact i heard that i heard that most that games are not con to be considered released until things have been announced almost like even if you've worked on something on studio for many years unless it's been announced you can never be <laughs> sure yeah. that you're gaming well. even if it's like three four five years down the line you have everything set up you just never know so that's like still uncertainty i know you know, it happens in movies as well. Potentially, projects will get canned. But yeah, so pitches is, is definitely something that happens in games. I have never experienced it quite in the same way how you guys did, where it's like a director, you work with a director, he's pitching something, and maybe it's like 
two weeks work or maybe he gets like a pitch together which is like a one month pitch and then he goes and pitches it to people who give me money for it and then if they like it like goes on it's a little bit different in games because really you would i believe when you do a pitch you will also have to like potentially build a little bit of a game with it mm-hmm. uh, and then go to stakeholders um, but even then I think you already will have like someone behind you like because as a, as a game company you are not doing like I don't know I, I just don't don't think you will be doing the, the traditional like pitch work like yeah, that, but that I, much I guess that's as, a, like as, a, as, a, as a game company you yeah. know like if, if you are doing internal let's say you are Sony Santa Monica, right? Mm-hmm. They will be doing pitches mm-hmm. themselves mm-hmm. for Sony, right? But at that point, they already have funding, right? Sony is paying them. Like, all they are trying to do is, like, get Sony approve a project and mm-hmm. give more money towards it. Mm-hmm. But it's not like they, you know, if they don't do the pitch, they'll just, you know, work on something else. It's it's not, I don't know if that makes any sense. But Yeah, totally. I mean, I, um, my experience in games work is working on games pitches, which are quite... Um, I, I would say it was it was really fun work. It was really enjoyable because I got to do a lot of kind of art direction stuff on it and talk a lot about, you know, what was actually happening in the game and what the gameplay would be and all this stuff. But what eventually ended up happening was I think I worked on this project for a few months and um, we finally got to the stage where they wanted some kind of like beauty frames just yeah. to kind of like start establishing the project a little bit more. And so... I started doing thumbnail stage, which was like a day. Then I did like some slightly more refined roughs of what they wanted. They picked one. And then as I started working on it, I emailed them for like a contract renewal. I was like, hey guys, I was like, "Uh, so just to make sure we're going to spend this this amount of time doing this just before this contract ends, then we're going to start a new contract here. And they emailed me back and they said, oh, sorry, we've actually just moved on to a new game. So we're going to give you a new project brief uh, tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was a totally different game with totally different assets. And yeah. then I was doing keyframes for this thing that had only existed for a few days. And so yeah. it was quite funny. I guess it's a different type of volatile, whereas it with a film pitch, when you're pitching, you're not like, it's not like you would ever change direction. It just yeah. ends or starts, right? Exactly, yeah. Whereas with a games pitch, because games generally have a slightly broader range of funding, I would say, and they're not like just a sole person's vision, usually as well. They're part mm-hmm. of the, like, the studio, yeah. right? Which has its own internal revenue streams. Um, they have the ability to say like, yeah, maybe this is working, maybe this isn't, and then just like pivot to a totally different idea. Yeah, or like bounce back a different idea and like kind of combine other stuff. I think it's like a good point, like if you've gone on YouTube and watched the making of Skull and Bones recently, mm-hmm. it was on YouTube, like how they changed the direction on it. Oh, that's like that's a that's a good yeah, that's a good kind of video to watch to understand like what can happen throughout the game development. Sometimes like game development cycle where you know the idea of like oh we're making what what is Skull and Bones? It's like the pirate something game, right? Yeah, it's it's, it's a with both pirate pirates. Uh, shoot, I don't know shooter looter kind of game. Yeah, exactly. But like the idea was like oh it's a pirate something game. They were they were trying to and initially they were trying to make it kind of like off of the success of Black Flag and Assassin's yeah. Creed, right? They're trying to replicate something like that and make it a multiplayer. Mm-hmm. But throughout the whole time, the the idea changed. Just just the core idea of it stayed similar, but like the the whole writing potentially changed. The whole uh, what is it called? Um, gameplay. Gameplay as yeah, well changed yeah. multiple times. So this happens in games uh, a lot. But um, yeah. So so as a, as a question, because you're talking about kind of similar pitching something in video games. From I never worked on a game, right? So. Is that similar to... Is that what Vertical Slice is? Or is no. Vertical Slice different? No, no, no. So Vertical Slice is something once you secured uh, mm-hmm. funding from okay. whoever you is, is giving you funding, you already have an idea. When you are pitching it, you're not just pitching artwork. You are pitching the story and you're pitching the gameplay as well and the gameplay group, all of that. That is what Pitch Deck is. Okay. It contains all these elements. And then they give you the money for vertical slides, let's say, or whatever you're doing, mm-hmm. like whatever stages you have, but the initial one year stage, mm-hmm. let's say, that you work on something. Mm-hmm. They they give you money for it, and then you go off and you build uh, a small part of the game, let's say. Uh, so that is like pre-production. Kind of. Once but then, you're past that point. But even then, I mean, games still, have so many change. different rounds of funding, mm-hmm. unlike films. Um, 
where once you've got vertical slice, you're essentially pitching for more funding. Exactly. To then do yeah. the next yeah, slice yeah. of the game. Exactly. So you're like you're constantly in this pitching phase until you go into pre-production. I believe when the game is already in pre-production, at that point you already have the game. You know exactly what it is. You don't know, and you just need to build the rest of the game essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, like when you get into the pre-production. Yeah. The other difference is as well in games, right, that a pitch is far more extensive than for a film. For a, for a film, yeah. really what we're doing is we've been like, here's the visuals, look how cool it's going to be. This will look good on screen. <laughs> Whereas for a video game, they're going, here's the visuals, here's the gameplay, here's the story, here's how the characters yeah. will work, here's the AI system we're going yeah. to use, here's exactly. everything. Sometimes the engine all... that we're going to use, are we going to build this in-house? No, we're going to yeah, use yeah. a custom physics engine that we're hiring this guy to build. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's like also like, how are we going to make money with the game? Exactly. Like, Play, is it going to yeah, be like yeah, yeah. Uh, Game Pass for film? It's like, Put in cinema. People watching it. <laughs> it's gonna be money cool. making. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah. In games, they do like studies, like what is the market looking at right now? Yeah. Two point five percentage is chance that this will be the better kind of title to go. And then for they go, something. no matter what the market says, they go, it's got to be an extraction shooter. Guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My God, dude, that's what. Imagine felt like. Fortnite and Tarkov. Dude, as soon as I'm, <laughs> sh- dude, I'm shitting, you. I'm telling you, like when Fortnite came out, I'm sure that this is what was happening in the industry. <laughs> It's like, look at how, look how much money Fortnite's making. Yeah. It was just like um, Call of Halo and Call of Duty had exactly the same effects on the industry, right? Yeah. Everybody mm. started copying. Like, I remember when Call of Duty got really, really big. Like it had that like peak period around like MW2. Mm-hmm. Every single game was just copying Call of Duty. Yeah. And I was like, just absolutely a deluge of the same thing over mm-hmm. and over again. Yeah. It was great. Loved it. Yeah, yeah man. I, I mean, it's, I like repeater of the. Yeah. If there is something that works. I mean, this happens all the time, even in movies, right? You, you you see a cycles of similar movies, and then and then it switch to something else. Like I guess now we're seeing a bit the downfall of superhero movies. They they get a bit less and less. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are a bit less excited by it. I think now with simple video games, it was like. I want to go shooter. back to I want to go back to cowboy films. Yeah. Oh man, good. cowboy yeah. era. Yeah. You remember that movie? What's the name of that movie? It's like Cowboys versus Aliens. Yeah, with oh, Daniel Craig. Yeah, <laughs> it was a good movie. Come on, man. I don't. Re- I don't remember. Remember it, but I remember being Dude. a kid and being like, "Holy shit, <laughs> so cool." The the much better cowboy film is Wild Wild West. Oh, with, that's my childhood. With the so good steampunk Will yeah. Smith fighting tiny crab man with the tank. It's yeah, such a cool thing. We should watch that film. The yeah, CGI in that movie is questionable. No, it was good. I think the, it doesn't take me out of it. I Wild watched it Wild West recently. and the League of the Extraordinary, Extraordinary Gentlemen. Gentlemen. That's my childhood. With Sean that was Connery. Like, yeah, the guns they have, the bad guys, also cool. It's like space space marines bolters, but in real life, I really love it. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I, I I wish I could do a Sean Connery impression. Um, I, I could do it if it was French. <laughs> it's not fair, so I cannot. <laughs> okay. Um, um, but anyway, so yeah. Shall uh, we move on? So what? So as we as we know, watching Wild Wild West is an essential part of pitching. Yeah. Um, but once you're past watching Wild Wild West with Wilson's your investors, eat spaghetti in your movie. That's yeah. the question. <laughs> I mean, what what's next? I mean, so in film, we move on to pre-production. So generally, this is when a film's pitch has received funding yep. and the green light to go ahead. Um, Prior to really like jumping into concept art pre-production, there are a few things that happen. Generally, um, a smaller film team will go out and do things like location scouting. Oh, yeah. There will be some concept artists working on the film prior to like full-blown pre-production beginning, but usually it's a much smaller condensed team. Maybe just like sometimes one to two people. Yeah. Um, also, like a storyboard, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's like how does the location tie in to the story? Yeah. How can that look cool in the, yeah. in the thing? But it's generally just figuring out, like, okay, how are we going to shoot this? Where are we going to shoot it? Which teams do we need to organize? Starting to put together your actual film crews. For example, if you're doing a leg in Morocco, right, and you're doing a, a, a leg in LA, can you have the same crews doing each of these things? Mm. Probably not. So you already have to be looking for like first and second ADs for these different locations. Uh, maybe even a different director of photography in some cases, right? Depending on people's scheduling. So that's really like when concept art starts getting involved, the film production is generally already in like completely full swing. There's like probably a few hundred people working on it at that point already, uh, just trying to get it going, uh, which can be quite fun and exciting to jump into. But the filming hasn't started, right? Because it's pre-production. So Yeah, I think pre-production extends the whole way from film about to start and then actually starting the yeah. whole way through to it yeah, having yeah. finished being shot, essentially. I want also to mention that, for example, on TV shows, 
they will be filming the first episode of a TV show as we would be working on a design for like five episodes down the line, right? And mm. then as they film the fifth episode and we'll be working at the end of the season and as they finish the first season, we'll already be on season two. And so like this is a, I mean, I guess depending on the budget of the of the project, of course, but it's some of these elements take time to kind of go forwards. And as a concept artist, you're always working a bit before the, produ- the production. Yeah. It's interesting to know that they don't like pre-plan. There must be some, like if they do a TV show, like I've been watching the Severance TV show. I mean, yeah. to be fair, like it's a pretty simple sets and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I imagine for a more complicated TV shows, so like let's say talk about the, what is the sci-fi TV show that I watched? Foundation. Yeah, Foundation. Yeah. Like, did they? Ooh, do you think watching they? Watching it too. They, oh, it's awesome. It's an awesome show. Do you do you think they pre-planned all everything? In, yes. Yes. In yes. Okay. Yes. So they pre-planned. The, everything. Also, it depends on the TV show, right? The the one I'm, I'm I was talking about is an, a TV show where every episode re- renews itself quite a lot. So every episode is a brand new story. Oh, okay. So okay. F- for that, it, we had to kind of you know work. Uh, in this type of uh, pipeline, I guess. But yeah, I assume if you do like any other TV show where there's like, you know, uh, maybe 10 locations across the whole show, you then, you know, the set is going to be used many, many times throughout the episodes and that kind of stuff. But also the thing is like, well before concept artist even gets involved, it's just like the the amount of prep work that has to go into yeah. just shooting somewhere, like getting filming permissions, for mm-hmm. example, is a massive thing. There was a film that I worked on once Mm. where they had planned to film at a very specific location. They turned up on the day, 300 plus crew members, the cameras, all the rental equipment, the lights. And then when they arrived, they found out that the PA that had put in the request for filming had filed it incorrectly and they had to leave, which cost them like, you know, that's like a hundred grand or something, probably completely lost just from doing that. And so then they had to go and find a different filming location and it became a nightmare. F- films are like I think generally very very chaotic they're a little bit all over the place sometimes especially when you're in them sometimes you can be talking to somebody and you can just be like why am I doing this what's happening mm. but they are also very tightly coordinated I think where the chaotic element comes in is when those unexpected things happen which then throw things off course generally they are budgeted and kind of put together on a very, very tight deadlines. Yeah. So with the second something goes off even by like half a day, it throws the whole production yeah. out of kind of it, flow. Yeah. It is by default a very kind of a fluid process, right? I mean, because the as people design sets, the script might change again, you know? No. And as the script changes, we're going to do new concepts on the scripts. And we're going to work with the sets and with the scripts to how, to how does those two changes look at the end and like how to implement all those changes so it always changes yeah interesting i i thought like i for some reason i was thinking that there is going to be more change in games like for example i never thought that you would be that script could change in mm. a movie or a tv show it changes until the same day i feel like sometimes yeah. and that was insane. a big thing for the uh, the writers union strikes mm-hmm. as well was talking about how many writers that directors should have on set yeah. because generally you have a larger writer room at the start, but you always have writers around to continue reworking the film as you go. Because mm-hmm. as you see something being filmed as a director, you might realize like, oh, that line of dialogue is actually terrible. So then having yeah. three writers n- sitting next to you and you can just be like, rewrite that. And they go, <laughs> All right, give me options. And they go, okay. Yeah. I don't like this burger. No, now it's, I don't like this tacos. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, which I mean is usually like far, obviously broader ranging things yeah, yeah, than yeah, swapping yeah, yeah. a sandwich for a taco. But, but that, that was a problem with a lot of the movies which carried on during the strikes is that they didn't have any writers on set anymore. Yeah. Like a few of those productions carried on. And uh, that was a big trouble like because, yeah, I mean, we, we don't know yet, but I think a, a few of those projects might have weird writing <laughs> at some point because they didn't have anyone capable of fixing it available on yeah. stage as they were filming. So, Which referentially, just remember to anybody listening, there is a real tendency to blame writers for like bad scripts and films. Just remember, it's usually not the writer's fault. It's really it's telling them to change things in their scripts. Um, it's you know, I have a lot of sympathy for them. You yeah, know? totally. I think I think we're uh, in a similar boat. I mean, I guess we probably have an easier life than they have because we are a bit later in the in the in the process. So we maybe get less impacted by other people's choice. But you know, just budgets. 
like I, I've I've have, I've been asked to redesign the same thing many times many times when it had been greenlit just because they were like oh turns out we don't have the money for this effect so we need to look it needs to be cheaper to make or the opposite thing happens where they say we've got a lot of money let's rework this <laughs> <laughs> and they, you just yeah. do a hundred plus variations yeah. of like some tiny thing that will be on screen yeah. for one second and it, you know and then sometimes like oh this guy left the project so we have a new guy who turns out he wants to you know put his own uh, mark uh, mark so screw all this we're going to redo it his name's not mark he just wants to make a mark on the yeah, project yeah, just yeah. clarify i'm sure there is a guy called mark who's done that yeah, yeah. but we're not talking about anybody called mark so mark and if you're listening mark. we're not talking about you if, if your name is mark and then you, you sign your piece of concept yeah you leave your mark ah. yeah. Ooh. mark think, think mark. about it guys think mark always you know if, if we had tiktok that would be a short on tiktok with like uh yeah Thousands of views. Just, just staring yeah. at Jules very disappointedly yeah. right now. Yeah. Anyway, so, so games. No, wait, wait, wait. We're oh, not done shit. yet. We're not done oh, yet. Because no. <laughs> there's one more thing we have to talk about, which is what skills you actually need to have to do film pre production work. Yeah. Which is all the generally, skills. To be honest, yeah, it's all the skills, right? It's very similar to pitch work in some ways. You often will be doing that messier, tighter work, especially again, if somebody changes a script thing and you have to do something. A little bit very less fast, right? Yeah. There's a little bit less fast. Rather than working on, say, two concepts a day, you're doing one a day, maybe, you know, one to yeah. two, three a week. It varies. Sometimes you do, you do, I you guess, do various production. Yeah. I've been in, 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 in the situation where it's like very, very fast, and sort of situation is like, oh, you've got a week to do it. Yeah. So it, it varies, I guess, the project. Something that changes c- c- compared to pitch, though, is that it is slower, but it's also expected to be tighter work, right? Yeah. It, needs to, it needs to look better because, again, then you need to convince everyone on the table when they're going to pitch it to, like, where if the production designer wants to design a set and you're helping him, then he's still going to have to go to the director and pitch this design to the director. So he needs to have something that looks good and something that makes sense in order to get the the, the set to green it. Yeah, and also another thing is that generally all of that work that you produce will... Uh, probably have some involvement with a bit of a 3D process because Mm -hmm. a lot of that work will then get carried over to the production designer where they're going to then potentially use it as like an SDL and print it and, Mm -hmm. you know, rework it. Yeah, on sets, on anything really, a prop, a set, Mm -hmm. a, a, a character design, having that kind of more 3D process is a lot more expected in that stage just because, yeah, you probably will have to show it from multiple angles. It might have to be built and you have to give a much clearer idea of like the physicality of whatever that object or thing that you're making is. Mm-hmm. I guess the difference is pitch, you make pretty image to get people happy and excited about a project. Pro- pre-production and production, you're not longer an illustrator. You are now part of a full-on pipeline and people are on the movie before you and people are on the movie after you and you just need to be useful to them. And you'll get, as Dan said, you'll get 3D files, you get a lot of uh, things that people have done before you and then you need to modify them, do your work on top of these and then send it to other people, maybe like previous, maybe, as you said, people who are going to do the props or who are going to make the sets. And so you need to really fit within that pipeline. So I think 3D and like... um, yeah, 3D skills are essential at this stage. Yeah. Okay, now you can talk, Stefan. Uh, we'll allow it. <laughs> video games, <laughs> pre-production. So pre-production in video games is not quite um, what you would think of pre-production. So before pre-production, there's another pre-production, which, uh, so there's a pitch work, and then let's say you did your vertical slice, you... You got more money, well, you, you're not, you're not uh, firing everyone. <laughs> and what you're going to do next is build more concepts to fill out, the, fill out the world. Because like when you are on the vertical slice, you are doing some of the production stuff as well. So you're mm-hmm. not just coming up with blue sky ideas at this point as a concept team. You are serving the people who are building the game or something, whatever mm-hmm. they are building. Uh, you are doing the... Um, the concepts for them, for the 3D team, to make sure they build it correctly, that it works, and you do overpaints. So you kind of go through this little stage of like building a game, and then you are at the beginning again, mm-hmm. right? And you are trying to figure out the whole world again, but now in a bigger scale because now you are building the next stage, right? 
it has to be a bigger scale. So you do kind of like some more blue sky exploration, essentially. Mm -hmm. And this stage can be as long or as short as it depends on the project, on the funding. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully it's longer. The longer it is, the more time you have to develop the world before you have to start doing production concepts again. Mm -hmm. The worst thing that can happen uh, is if you just finished with like your vertical slice work or whatever, and then you need to start doing like exploring the world and doing concepts for the environment team to start or like whatever character team to start building off of for mm -hmm. more like the final game mm -hmm. because then it's just like a, um, and there's not a nice way to say it but then it's just a mess <laughs> of of like doing two things at once doing like polished concepts and exploring the world at once yeah. figuring out our direction so if you have like a little stage of this which is like what's called the blue sky exploration that mm -hmm. comes before the pre-production, mm -hmm. then you are a happy chap. So what would be a, an <laughs> example of, of, a, of a concept for that? Is it like, oh, uh, okay, okay, let's go back to uh, the, the, the dragon thing. Yeah. So there's a game with dragons. Yeah. So is it like you do whatever you want within the world that has dragons and then you just do your thing? Or do they give you more rules? I guess it depends on the project. But I think there is usually going to be a little bit of a script written yeah. to it or a little bit of... Uh, you know, some something, even if it's like a maybe five sentences or something like that, or maybe 10 sentences long, mm -hmm. uh, that will describe potentially a couple areas. And at this point, you are just, uh, if you have multiple people, they'll all do something, something like we'll all be like, I'm working on the on the beautiful forest or something, right? With fairies flying mm -hmm. around. And then another dude will be working on uh deep sea the ugly forest the the, the deep <laughs> sea the deep around. sea with dragons that are flying that are uh, swimming through the deep sea you know yeah. we all will have these uh, things and we can all jump between each other's areas but at this point you're just doing concepts that are similar to what you guys were describing in the pitch as well okay. so you are just doing one of concepts uh maybe sometimes you do like three concepts related to the same thing, so might, you might use a 3D scene, but a lot of the time you're okay if you're using a lot more 2D techniques yeah. because the concepts are just like kind of... The for ideation. Exactly, they're for ideation and they might be explored later on. Yeah, so there's, at this stage, there's, there's no level designers, there's no, uh, no. 3D modeler who's yeah. going to be like, dude, what the fuck is your 3D model? Exactly, no, model no yeah. one's going to be doing that. At this stage, you're just coming up with ideas and the closer you get towards the end of the stage, the the more you'll be like, have to be like, okay, like this is the final idea and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And doing like more towards be like figuring out exactly what you're doing. Yeah. But the first, at the beginning, you're just doing random, cool. random yeah. shit. So, and because that's, is that pre-production? Because that's then- That's blue sky kind of. And yeah, then so it's pre-production. Pre -pre exactly. And then you have pre-production. And then you have pre-production where you already did your blue sky, whatever, mm -hmm. and you'll be starting to do more what you guys said, where you're helping already the team mm -hmm. to build something. Mm -hmm. There already is a script. Not everything is fully figured out. But at this point, like the environment team goes, we need to build this uh, underwater castle with sky with dragons mm -hmm. uh, swimming around. Mm -hmm. And you already have the concepts for it because they were like, oh, it was in the initial concepts. We liked it. Yeah. And I have to go and design the castle properly. Yeah. I have to design the area properly. They will start building it out and then you have to like do overpaints and shit like that. So that's going to be... It's like turning your pretty image and your mood image yeah. into something that becomes um, useful for production. So yeah. it's like, as you said, so how does the castle work? But then what does that mean? Are you going to just model the castle or are you going to do like a, a 3D sheet, like a, the model sheets of the castle? Or Probably the same. That you guys are you going to be sketches. suggesting like gameplay at this point with your concepts? Yeah, at this point you'll be... Uh, that's You already you're always want to suggest a gameplay a little bit, even if you're pre-production concepts. There should always be, um, there should always be suggestions of like where the characters can walk around. Even like it's cool if you, if you go, oh, this area will be like this during, uh, during evening, and then during the day something will change, and it's part of the gameplay, right? Mm -hmm. And people like that, even if you are in the pre-production phase. Yeah. But in the yeah. Oh, sorry, even if you're in the pre-pre-production phase. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in the actual pre-production, you have to pay attention more to the gameplay. You cannot do a, do a sketch of a fort and then there's nowhere to walk around. So, so how, many, just, it'll be just shut on how many years into a development cycle are, are other people starting to get involved? Because uh, at this point, it's what? It's you, narrative team, I see what you mean, yeah. who else? And then when does it start to become mm. a slightly more fully-fledged kind of 
thing. Because because game goes through like these many different stages of like vertical slice, you always have teams mm-hmm. of 3D people and you know people who code the game as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so whilst you are working on like the pre pre production phase, they will be working on their own pre pre production phase, which could be like building tools, figuring out processes, making sure that like like gameplay loops, yeah, or maybe even like if they need to explore a certain art style, like they need to know how are they gonna make their meshes, how are they gonna make so like it's a lot of research that they'll be doing whilst you're figuring out the rest of the world. Mm. Um, so like yeah. you're doing the art direction yeah. pre-pro and exactly. they're doing the tools pre-pro the how to build the sets the, pre-pro yeah, you know how yeah. do I what kind yeah. of uh, hammers do the, I need the, for the, this the R&D thing? it's like yeah. it's like, oh yeah we have dragons but how do the dragons know you're a player and you're here and then yeah. you have to develop the AI for it and all yeah. that stuff yeah. okay yeah. cool so that will be happening uh, throughout the whole process and then you get to vertical slice right which is kind of where real yeah. pre-production begins yeah that's vertical so when you're in vertical slice um, you know. Why don't you explain what it is as well first? So we kind of talked about vertical yeah, slice, just... but the the reality is like really before vertical slice, you have something. It depends on what company this is, but there will be something called like first playable or something like that, mm-hmm. which is the thing that is like part of the pitching to the to the people. Or it's like when the gay people already gave you some money and they mm-hmm. said do a proof of concept or something like that. You build it, uh, but then you need to go back and when figure out how to do a vertical slice and your vertical slice is your actual game. So when you do uh-huh. a vertical slice, you already know what the fuck you're making. And if yeah. you don't, you're in a big trouble. Uh, so if you if you know what you're making in vertical slice, you just, uh, you know, you know exactly like what the game's going to look like. Whatever is in vertical slice will most likely make it into the final game. Yeah. So it's like, you know, <laughs> no, no, no messing around, around yeah. at that point. That's, that's, there's, there's no, any, there's nothing comparable to that in a movie, but it's almost like shooting a, a short film or like the first five minutes of your movie yeah and then and then they're like yeah this sounds it's, good it's vertical size the demo of the game I would yeah say. that's yeah, how true. i think of it it's like when you play fifa and you have the mm-hmm. 15 minute demo that's what vertical slice yeah. is it's like a slice of the game that has all the playable ingredients in it actually i was watching the documentary of how they made um, the last of us the the part two and at some point they're like oh shit we need the demo playable at uh, e3 for journalists to, pl- to, to play. Yeah. And it's like they explain this whole stage very well, like yeah. this whole process very well. So yeah, you guys should. I watched a little bit of that. It, w- it was fun. The bit that I focused on was watching uh, John Sweeney throwing blood against walls and ripping yeah. apart <laughs> yeah. bits of flesh with Wait, his teeth. What? Yeah, there's a part of that. Yeah, Wait, because, for because references. The, the references for the concept are. No way. Yeah. There are a lot of the stuff in Last of Us, the way they achieved that like hyper-realistic look was to do a lot of first-hand photography. So, and a lot of the realism in the animations as well came from them doing tests with like blood bags and stuff like that. Um, so they just went, they just have like this big white room mm. and then John Sweeney's in the middle of it leaning down with like a giant hunk of meat and he's like ripping into it with his teeth, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. happens, right? He's, he's, he's actually being a zombie. He's like yeah. acting like a zombie and like... It's like totally covered in blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you have people taking pictures of him <laughs> and um, they're like, yeah, that's what we want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's quite cool. Yeah. I've never, I've never seen that happen. Yeah. I think it's nice when you get to have the time to actually explore yeah. uh, firsthand kind of reference gathering in a project. That That's how you get to the level of details that these guys got. Yeah. Know? Like yeah. this this game is such a, I mean, to me, it's, it's an amazing game and it's such a crazy level of detail and mass, like, yeah. masterclass that yeah of course they it makes sense that they go to such length to allow themselves to have the references and the raw material to then build upon yeah, um, yeah. pretty sick cool so then you have your vertical slice and then i guess vertical slice get greenlit and then that's production right then you just make the game yeah after that you go well vertical slice gets greenlit and then it's not production. It's just like the start of you. It again starts as a pre-production, but it's just a different type of pre-production, right? It's like pre-production for level two. It's a pre-production for the final game, and no. then you just and at the pre-production for final game, you don't do as much in a, as a concept artist because the world is already figured out. Well, and like they could potentially start outsourcing your work as well at that point, mm-hmm. and they might thinking start if you're like core core team, they might start thinking of pushing you onto another project. Oh, ah, yeah, okay. So uh, like the next game. The next game, yeah. yeah. Um, but you, it just depends, right? Like, I heard different studios do it differently. Yeah. Like, yeah, I know, like, in Sony Santa Monica, 
they like when I watch the God of War thing, I know they like to have multiple projects running mm-hmm. at a time. Mm-hmm. And actually a lot of big companies like to do that because sometimes a project might just end up going nowhere. Yeah. And then you have a bunch of people that you need to transfer quickly yeah. or you fire them. If you have one project, you fire everyone. Yeah. You don't want that to happen. If you have two projects, at least you move them to another project for a while. Uh, that's what happened. God yeah, it's, of War, it's for quite example. impressive to to see how many like now. I think Santa Monica they got a few projects f- that they talked about publicly. Um, Naughty Dog have like many projects as well, and like um, also uh, um, they cancelled like all of them. Yeah, they cancelled a few of them, I guess. But uh, the studio that surprised me the most I heard about recently is um, the people who do The Witcher and oh, uh, CD Projekt Red. CD Projekt Red. They have like three Witcher games, I think, in, officially that they announced in production, and like. Cyberpunk 2 in production and like another license I think and you're like but how many you guys are working on it but they just announced all these games that they're going to come out in like 2030 it's, <laughs> it's, it's like, very easy to say that you're working on stuff yeah yeah um, it's, it's like Elder Scrolls yeah, I so could so say five. I could say I'm working on Star Wars it may or may not happen in the future who knows <laughs> so you know <laughs> that's the dream that if in five years time I am technically it was true and if these <laughs> games come out in 10 years time technically it was true as well I mean yeah. I think oftentimes a lot of these companies um, you know they like my to own movie who's going to revolutionize the whole they, world I, I oh sorry I want to say like sorry go on no I was just going to say a lot of these companies like to say they're working on stuff because that's how they increase stock interest especially yeah, when they're correct. publicly traded I was going to say the same and that's how they get people to I mean like when Cyberpunk was announced that was easy way for them to hire people, right? They announced Cyberpunk. Yeah. Let's say they have problems with hiring people. They announced Cyberpunk. Boom, everyone's like, oh, I want to go work on that. They all apply to CG Project Red. Now they're finally hiring people, right? And yeah. then it comes out seven, eight, yeah. nine years later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I was watching a thing even about Blizzard yesterday. Um, and they were talking about how they had a bit of a slump uh, during, I think, like 2018. And you guys will probably remember this. They went on stage at BlizzCon and they announced the Diablo mobile. Yeah, that was... And then everybody started booing them and all this stuff. And the reason they did that was because it wasn't a mainline game. It was produced by NetEase. And it wasn't even one that they uh, apparently theoretically intended to even announce Mm. at BlizzCon because they knew it wouldn't be received well. But their stock price started to fall. And so they essentially... I mean, this could just be bullshit. This is what was in the video. But... um, they had like lacking investor kind of mm. like sentiment essentially. And so they thought, okay, we've got to announce some stuff at our big event. What can we do? Okay, here's this thing that Netty's produced. Fuck it. Let's do that. And we'll do a big stage announcement for that, yeah. which yeah. then obviously backfired incredibly hard. Yeah. But that is often how it works, right? Is And it's the same with films, right? A lot of movies you hear about them are like, this is in production, that's in production. There's um loads and loads of stuff out there where like, whenever somebody sends a pitch or even something that's in pre-production yeah. to me, I'll often just go on the internet and see how much is written about it yeah. <laughs> just to see like whether it's real or not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and of course, even like the earliest, earliest stage stuff where like nothing's even happened yet, you can find articles about it because yeah, oh, these, pr- these production companies want to push out, hey, we're working on this. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that cool? And yeah. the same for the directors, you know, someone always leaks something. It's quite surprising actually because it's like, oh, this thing is so secret. And then you just, you're like, what is this director up to? And he's like, oh, he's apparently working on a dragon movie. Yeah. We, we, we keep on the dragon team here. Yeah. And it's like, oh, very Fair secret movie. indeed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, movie. don't open that door. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah. So, so then you go into production in movies, right? Well, I think production and pre-production are generally understood the, the same, same thing. Okay, so just yeah. blending Because together. again, okay. as they build a set, you're going to help design the next set or has, as they... Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess. As they say, you're not doing good enough. You start crying. You yeah. know, all these things that happen at the same time. Yeah. yeah. It happens everywhere. But uh, no, I, yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. I think like we're talking about your like games has a lot more stages to it. Generally in film, once you're in pre-production as a concept artist, not that much changes regardless mm-hmm. of how much is being filmed yeah. um, until you then transition into post-production. Okay. Um, post-production generally is, can actually happen during filming as well. Yeah. But it starts to begin once uh, plates have been shot. Plates are kind of like in the film industry, what we just call like any photography that has been done. Yep. Uh, specifically for concept artists, it's photography that we want to work over. Um, and so what happens is, let's say a director has filmed a uh, really nice b- bunch of knights on a hill and you want to stick a caster behind it and you've got a vague concept for it. Well, our job is to go in, 
take that plate, quote unquote, mm -hmm. cut out all of the important elements that matter and then start replacing the elements that will be CGI in the background to show the director how that will look in the final shot. It's like anything that's not fully on film. So as soon as there's like blue screen, green screen or any creature who's not an actor, that's going to need some VFX on top, right? And, and as soon as VFX companies are involved on the movie, they start post-production. Uh, so, you know, even as, as Dan said, sometimes they're still filming, but they already filmed some part of the movie. Yeah. And because there's so many VFX shots that need to be made, they're already going to start working on the matte painting, on uh, the creatures, you know, um, because sometimes the creatures even are not designed before filming or they're partly designed or yeah. some secondary creatures are designed. They're like, oh yeah, just this company is going to make this creature appear here. What is it going to look like? That's a problem for tomorrow. Yeah. And then post-production will be designing this creature, designing the set extensions and that kind of that kind of Because work. oftentimes, let's say even as a concept artist, we can look at, you know, the wonderful work that somebody like, I think John Park is a very good example of it mm. does, um, where he does these absolutely insanely beautiful paintings, right? But John Park's work might not be informative to a VFX crew who is looking for like hyper-realism as to what they actually need to design and build. It will give the, every it gives everybody the information. It gives everybody the vibe and the mood and, what we actually have to move forward with. So for example, on Dumbo, he did loads of like phenomenal paintings of like the circus tent area. Mm -hmm. um, but then artists that, I think it was Dean Egg, uh, went in and took those things as mood inspiration and then redesigned them so that every single nook and cranny was kind of like visibly understood by whatever team had to jump onto it next. Yeah, totally. Um, I think it's also good to point out at this, like at this stage that like the time that these things can happen can vary immensely like you could work on a pitch and then five years later the film is in post yeah you could work on a pitch and 10 years later the film is in post if it has a really troubled development yeah or two years later yeah <laughs> or I, I mean i worked on a film that was um it was a pitch to the director from the vendor i worked with at the time and from there it was one year until we were in post yeah and uh so that some films if they're like organized very efficiently or potentially have different legs of shooting. So for example, with that film, they were doing a leg in the UK and then they were doing a leg in New York. So that became like the two separate kind of like stints that they had to do. So yeah. they did the London leg first because it was easier for them with the scheduling. And then they moved all of the shoots over to the States to do the next bit. But because they'd already shot everything in London, it meant that VFX work could already be in like full swing production by mm. that stage. Very cool. And so I guess movies that go that fast is quite unusual, but it's good to know that it happens. But TV shows very often move that fast. Uh, like TV shows, are <laughs> and Dan is Dan is, Dan is just choking down. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, TV shows what? Uh, but yeah, TV shows do move that fast, and not not even mentioning advertisements. If like you guys happen to do any advertisement work, that's like you <laughs> do a. I guess you don't even do pitches. It's like do a concept. And the concept also be is the, the post-production. It's like all at the same time in advertisement. Yeah, same in music videos as well. Yeah. I did some yeah. music videos where, um, I think I've said this before for um, very- You did. Yeah. Did I, did I break that NDA? Yeah. Whatever, Taylor Swift. Um, and uh, it, it was her in her private chat. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. no just joking. Um, but that was very quick. I mean, that was like literally sometimes days in between yeah. like do the concept then they would build the set then they'd film it and then yeah. it was done and i was like oh shit that was fast like, what does it look like we don't know okay when do you need it for yesterday okay when are you shooting tomorrow <laughs> and you need the prop yes yeah. <laughs> and, and and they have to make it they haven't made the prop yet and you're filming when again tomorrow okay cool <laughs> yeah it's very interesting yeah it's um so it, the timelines do massively change like you said advertising music videos any of those slightly more i would say like I mean, film is very commercial, but yeah. even more commercial activities that you might often have to do as a concept artist, those have incredibly tight yeah. turnarounds, for sure, where you can jump the whole way from pitch to post in a few days. <laughs> I want to ask about post-production work for movies. Like, do you... Because I know you do a lot of... I believe you do a lot of VFX during that time. Like, when I go through our station, I see people doing... I remember ages ago seeing like, I don't know what's the name of the guy, but he was doing, he's like this guy from Germany doing like for Marvel uh, film, like a lot of explosions or like mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of, what is it called? Like sonic beams or something. Yeah. I remember him seeing sure. and be like, I've, I didn't know that that's something that you would do. And this is like 
tons of the work that you do in post production, or or is it different? So de depending on the company, you might be doing more or less uh, VFX work like this, right? Some companies uh -huh. they, they have a matte painting department where they, those mat, the matte painters will do a lot of of VFX, or um, even like they would do R and D type of VFX stuff. Um, but yes, it happens that you have to do explosions, loads of explosions, or um, any type of VFXy thing like this on the on his like magic. Yeah, magic. Yeah. Um, it's also is a skill that's very different to the other type of concept art we usually do, which means that it's very heavily photo bashed. So, and it needs to look very realistic because you're working on an already existing plate, which is oh, something yeah, that's course, been filmed, yeah. right? Yeah. So this work needs to be quite polished, quite good looking, so people can, so we can guide the VFX people on how to do it afterwards. Uh, Dan, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say, if you want to see, uh, if you're a student out there and you don't quite know uh, mm -hmm. what this kind of stuff is, some really good portfolios to look at are Paolo Giandoscos from DNEG. Um, he mm -hmm. has some really interesting different types of post-production work, which range from like animation to like some hyper-polished VFX concepts. But also um, Cole Price has some really good stuff on yep. his portfolio, I think from the Adam Project, which is great, where you can really get a good taste of like the kind of work that again you might be asked to do the other thing is post-production too i think is the time where you have to do the most iterations probably mm -hmm. in a process uh post is kind of often where again like something hasn't been designed yet and the director is usually very busy at that stage and so sometimes you i've worked on some shows where i have uh without joking here done like well over 200 versions of like just an explosion mm -hmm. for a director and you'll be having meetings with with whoever is in charge whether it's the vfx supervisor or the director and they'll be saying like no that that explosion isn't uh lion enough <laughs> and you go what and they go what yeah if, it's... what if it doesn't explode what <laughs> i had that makes uh, sense, man. I, I, I remember having a meeting with a guy about it yeah again an explosion frame that needed to be designed and they were talking about uh, they were like, we want it to look like magic, but uh, we also know that, like, obviously in this world, it's not magical. But the director said he really likes the idea of it being kind of magical, mm. like it's reaching out for the guy. But we obviously can't do that. But if you could do that, but not do it, that would be really good. Anyway, make it pop, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> make it look cinematic. Make it pop. I don't know what I want. I'll know when I see it. <laughs> yeah, I I think the funny the... iteration five hundred down layer. <laughs> Daniel like drawing and then and comes then out of his cave. And, and then they open back your first iteration. They're like, <laughs> wait, that's amazing. That's what we wanted from the start. You're like, yeah. what? Is, uh, 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 but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. It is often the, I think the other thing that's worth saying about post-production is that uh, with pitch and pre-production, you're usually very attached to the core film crew, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I think the most attached you often are is you're working with the production designer, which mm -hmm. is the director's number two, besides mm -hmm. the director of photography, yeah. right? Uh, whereas once you're in post-production, you are way more removed. So you are often removed by, you will be working with a VFX supervisor. Yeah. The VFX supervisor will then be working for a vendor, which mm -hmm. is usually where you work, for example, frame store in our case. Mm -hmm. Then that VFX supervisor will often be working with a client-side VFX supervisor. Mm -hmm. And then that client-side VFX supervisor will be working under potentially still a production designer and a director. Yeah, <laughs> And so... When you do one concept of, say, you're making Dr. Hat Stranger's hand glow or whatever, you're going through potentially five or more stages of approval. And often what happens is Damn. something will get unapproved before it even gets to the last stage. Yeah, that's Which means insane. that even if you do like 300 versions of something, it doesn't mean that the director sees 300 versions yeah. of it. Yeah. Which then can be very interesting because you're kind of playing a little bit of a game of um, Chinese whispers in a way. Yeah. Where like, I've had it in certain, again, like client situations where I've done something, the VFX supervisor has said like, make it blue. And I go, oh, I thought it should be yellow. And they go, no, blue. The director wants it blue. And then you come back to a meeting with them a week later and they go, why'd you make it blue, man? <laughs> the director said yellow. And you're like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's yeah. my bad. Uh, you just kind of have to take it on the chin. Yeah. But it's it's the stage where I think the most communication, uh, most miscommunication happens yeah. because yeah. generally the channels hmm. have broken down quite a lot more at that point. Again, when you're in pre-production, everybody's in one location together. The production designer could literally probably run over, smack the director on the back of the head and be like, what do you think of this if you really wanted to? If it was desperate, right? Whereas with VFX vendors, there's often, you know, like 10 to 12 different companies working with 
going through like multiple different VFX yeah. supervisors working on different scenes and the director has to see all of them every single day and it can be very very hard to get any yeah. kind of like solid opinions on stuff which makes the process a million times more difficult on on previous jobs uh, it happened to me that I would be working for like a month or something and I'm like oh what did the director thinks of it and they're like we don't know we haven't showed him yet I'm like <laughs> yeah but I've done uh, all these versions and, and changes for you guys and they're like yeah but uh, no we haven't shown him yet I'm like Okay, <laughs> he's been busy, and yeah, and so you're like, oh, I'm so glad I I've, I'm done that, and it looks cool, and I'm happy that they're happy with it. But then you realize that no, you just passed their their like yeah. pass, and then there's like someone else that might just go back and say, oh no, I, I want a shrimp now, not a dragon, yeah. which is a problem in of itself because <laughs> unfortunately, um, you know, films are very kind of like single minded in some respects. Obviously, mm -hmm. they're a collaborative medium, mm -hmm. but directors do kind of have the be all end all say on stuff, excluding producers. Mm -hmm. And so what can happen is that other people through that pipeline want to put their imprint on the film mm -hmm. without quite necessarily understanding what the director of themselves wants. Mm -hmm. And so that's then where you can have even more miscommunication happening because then, like you said, somebody delays your work being shown for over a month yeah. and then they show it to the director and they go, well, what is this, sorry? And they yeah. go, oh, I thought this is what you wanted. And they, they go, no. And they're like, well, actually it was the concept art department's fault. And yeah. it all just gets <laughs> like lumped onto you. It's Daniel's fault. Everyone, <laughs> point him. Um, but yeah, that said, by the way, I've, I've myself never been in a case where I had to do as many iterations as Dan did, for example. So it varies the project, right? Uh, sometimes on VFX stuff, I had to do like three iterations, which is, I think, not I've a, had projects like that right, too. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it happens that sometimes you do 20, sometimes you do more, sometimes you do less. But it's not always that, because I think we just made it sound awful. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> but it can, it can be that bad. It can be bad, bad, yeah. Uh, in fact, I would say in the majority of my experiences working yeah. in post, it is that yeah. bad. But that's just my experience. Yeah. I think I've been lucky so far. Yeah, it does. It does. It depends who you're working with, yeah. where they are, why they're doing it, all these other things. And, um, you know, it's not to say that it can't be a rewarding part of the process, but mm -hmm. I'd say it's definitely less fun than other sections of the job in film. On the bright side, once when you do a VFX frame which which gets approved, yeah. that's most likely going to be a one-to-one -one frame in the movie. Yeah. And if it gets greenlit for you to share it, that's going to be a great thing to share because you're like, oh, look at this frame I designed. Uh, and then it's like, oh yeah, it's just like the movie. Yeah. And Except, happy. fair warning, it will only be on screen for 0.5 of a second. Yes. So uh, you get a very brief glimpse of joy as you see yeah. it go, especially with explosions. That's always a big thing. They're like, <laughs> this is the end explosion. It's got to be epic. It's got to be really cool. And like, I, you know, you're explaining to them like, and then it could implode and they could do this as if it's like a full, like drawn out, like, I don't know, sequence from Dragon Ball, you know, where they're like doing the Kami Yami or whatever at each other. And it's like, da, 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 da. and then actually in the film, you should just goes, yeah. and it's done. <laughs> and you're it's, like, the, it's, the, it's the Oppenheimer explosion. Yeah, yeah. Before you can even like tap your friend sitting in the cinema next to you to go, I did. Oh, it's gone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, in terms of games, yeah, how does that link? Post production, like quickly talking about production as well, because you guys kind of like skipped over it, but like, mm -hmm. Um, production in games like once the game is already being made and you know all the art direction and everything you'll be doing a lot of like just paint overs of the level designs and stuff mm -hmm. like that you'll probably be doing some designs as well uh, you know whatever creatures or whatever you will be building in the game just before you jump too far ahead can you explain how you do paint overs of levels and like what yeah. the process for that even uh, is it's, it's kind of you just get the screenshots from the 3D department that's working let's say on the environment since that's what I worked on the most sometimes you can ask them what angle you want it from depending uh, sometimes they'll just send you a screenshot be like overpaint this and you have to and you go okay <laughs> yeah and then they'll be go like make it better and uh, or like make it fit the art direction kind of yeah. more sometimes they don't know kind of what's wrong with it yeah. um, or what's up Jules because at this stage there's no design involved at all right it's just a, a level designer who make it who made no. the, the, the area look fun not, not quite no 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 so because you did all the blue sky work yeah. you know, and all the pre-production work and all this stuff, and the environment the, the team that already there, mm -hmm. like they they already built some assets and stuff like that. At okay. this point, they're already building the the, the levels okay. with some art assets already finished. So it's more than a block out. Exactly, it's okay. more than a block out. The, the, where it's it's not going to be too often, I think that you'll be working in production and then they'll be sending you just like pure level block outs. Mm -hmm. 
from what I've heard. I, I do think that it happened a lot, like on Last of Us, and that's what I did with Naughty Dog and whatever, but I like, I don't know. This is just from what I know, mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. say. I believe teams nowadays already have some assets that they will pre-build, and they'll send you a level that they'll already have. Maybe it's not going to be like fully in color with textures, but it will be more than just like cubes. Mm -hmm. uh, and at this point, um, especially, actually, maybe I'll add to this, especially on the, the this depends actually on the type of game that you're working on. Mm -hmm. I think maybe in, um, in games that are, um, Actually, I'm not going to go into detail here, but uh, it, it <laughs> just stopped himself, ladies and gentlemen. He just didn't break NDA <laughs> like a real uh, professional. Uh, so you will be working on uh, overpaints over whatever levels they send you yeah. with something that already is looking okay. And mm -hmm. then they'll just ask you to either bring in more core towards the final art yeah. direction, or maybe they don't know quite what they want in there. Maybe they don't know the lighting situation. They are like, oh, can you make it a bit more darker, moodier, or something like that? You're just going to do paint over for them, and then they're going to switch it around, make it look better. Or mm -hmm. maybe you already know what kind of other assets you've, they've built, and you think there are other assets that could fit into this area better. So you're just going to be like, well, we're just going to hit these things, put it around here, and it's going to look a lot better. Uh, yeah, it's like it's like you're the art direction experts in a way. Yeah, at this point, and so, and, and yeah. these guys are great at level design, but they're not. There's, there's not this art designers themselves. Exactly, it's like they kind of know yeah. the art direction, mm -hmm. but they don't know everything because yeah. they don't know everything about shape design. They don't know everything like all these ideas that you've put into the art direction material mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. what makes things scary, what makes things look pretty, what makes things look like they. Uh, they whisper through the sand. I don't know what that means, but whatever, you know. <laughs> I, can, I can just see. I can just see you, Stefan, whispering through the sand. You know, how do you make rocks feel like they are mysterious? I, don't know. I, so I like can see Stefan sending back a concept to the environment team with no paint over, but he just scrawled over it and read, "Whispers in the sand." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, how do you achieve that kind of look? It's something that you know, and you just need to point them in the right direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, you go into post-production i don't even know if that happens so in games. do you also <laughs> design props i mean not props but assets right is yeah, that yeah. so designing specific assets let's say a car mm -hmm. when does that happen is that before that or after that what you just what you just described sorry uh or designing guns or car yeah i see i see what you mean mm -hmm. it will be happening throughout the production mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you already have a few main assets at that point designed. So like, uh, let's say the character has guns or something like that. At this mm -hmm. point, you should already have the character design, like the main character will be designed yeah. and his main guns will be designed. But there will still be a lot of guns that might be kind of like 3D blockouts yeah. that you'll have to still design and then 3D modelers model it. Same goes with cars. You will By the time you are in production, you already have your main car, you know, but maybe there is a motorcycle. Maybe there is like a quad, quad, quad cycle or something. What is it called? Those you need to like still finish designing and sketching. So um, kind of similar how it is in movies. Like not everything will be designed by the time you are in production. You'll still be like finishing things off, but the main things will be mm -hmm. already like finished and okay. drawn. Um, and so then I guess people are finishing the game and as they really finish the game, yeah, there's less and less work for concept artists to do. There is, right? yeah, yeah, because you, as you said, you just established everything, and then maybe DLC, or yeah. Well, at this point, you don't know if you're gonna make DLC because you probably don't have the funding for it. But okay. what you're gonna do, as I said, most likely, you'll be doing still some pitch work for the marketing material potentially. Mm -hmm. You'll be doing ah, okay. some pretty concepts for that, uh, like what's gonna be at the front of the dvd or something yeah, the cover the posters the cover, yeah yeah the, the steam poster, page yeah, all that stuff yeah. and um you might be as i said as a concept team if you are in, like in high studio you'll be moving to potentially another project yeah um not necessarily a dlc i think unless they uh, unless unless maybe there is something funding big big mm -hmm. people think it mm -hmm. has a lot of potential you'll start doing some dlc work maybe yeah yeah and then that's it you're, you're done. I guess as well, if you're in games, right, and you're doing a live service game, which is becoming increasingly mm -hmm. consistent Oof, yeah. and like yeah. popular. Especially like every game that comes out nowadays. Yeah. Is mm. that, that, that 
is never ending theoretically so there's probably yeah, no yeah. such thing as like finishing it up i finished 50 guns more <laughs> yeah i wonder like what happens maybe like once you release a live service game you maybe never moved on to like pitching another project mm-hmm. so you just still kept working on it mm-hmm. you did some marketing maybe had a month off or something and then they bring you back on uh, because it's a live service game you'll have to be because like i imagine when you have a live service game you'll have multiple deals like dlcs planned mm-hmm planned up front yeah so you already be working on the dlcs that are after the release of the game with potentially a small core of the team right of writers maybe even some 3d artists Mm -hmm. to make sure that like when the main game is released already these assets are almost finished so they can so there can be another dlc another dlc maybe there's like i don't know let's say there's like five dlcs planned for the future but i doubt that the company will plan for more because they can never know how well the game i guess i guess it can be a season pass battle pass yeah something like that Imagine a battle pass for films. Um, you want to know if that, the guy dies or not? That that would work by you watching the same film multiple times, mm-hmm. and as you watch it, you would unlock special funny hats for the actors on the screen. Yeah, dude, let's go. Yeah. That's the future, man. So you like don't like it. the ending? If you watch it again, you can change it. <laughs> yeah, you can change the ending. That's kind of funny, though. Yeah, the director's cut. What oh, if yeah. uh, what if you watch it enough? That already exists, actually. <laughs> you watch it enough times, they send you like little perks, you know? Yeah, little boxes. Oh god, that'd be. Uh, Did you guys yeah. watch Donnie Darko? No, I heard about this. I watched it last night. What, what is, is it? Good? I'm very interested. Quite depressing. I uh, no, sorry, this is just so unrelated. But I was yeah. just thinking about Donnie Darko. It was it really. Uh, uh, you, you could watch it. Do you recommend it? Yeah. I think maybe you should watch the director's cut because there's, apparently there's a lot more explanation about the point of the film. Okay. It's a, it's very, I would call it, it's quite an eccentric film with the, the theatrical cut. But okay. It, yeah. It's interesting. I have... Uh, anyway, so maybe you could like get a season pass for Donnie Darko and yeah. make him wear a funny little hat. Yeah. Is what I was really you know trying to say. You know what I should get a season pass for is the Concept 101 podcast. If you listen to us many, many times, then we will send you another episode to, <laughs> 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 to many, many if times. You, if you listen to the Concept 101 podcast many, many times, then eventually what happens is you get to come to one of our very exclusive, definitely not free, public... What are they called again? Drink meetups? and Rose. Yeah. Meetups. Yeah. Draw meetup. That's true, by the way. That's a good opportunity to talk about. We, we do a drink and Do you like the rose. way I pulled that in, Jules? That was amazing. Thank you. That was amazing. I actually well was thinking about it at the same time. But... Uh, yeah, so Shut up! <laughs> for you guys who are in the UK and I guess in London, we also do uh, organize, of course, free to attend Drink and Rose and Museum meetups once per month. Yeah, which is one that's com- one is coming next week. Yeah, but that's going to come out after... The this podcast, podcast will come out after it happens. Oh yeah! Uh, so well, one just be- happened, so you can you can <laughs> look go on to our the next Instagram one. and you'll be wow! I'm so sad I missed it. But good news, there'll there'll be more. And so museum yeah. meetups, we basically go to a museum and we draw together and we meet and we have fun and we are socially awkward with each other. And the it's just like draw, the podcast in real life. Yeah, those and, usually happen on a weekend. Yeah, and drinking draws is right the same thing. But since people drink alcohol, they stop being socially awkward, mm. which is great. And those usually <laughs> happen during the week. On Thursday. Yeah, it's a week on Thursday. Which is which? The only reason I think we're bringing it up is because the last one we went to, nobody knew that we did other stuff. They were like, yeah. "Oh, like the podcast," and we were like. What? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know we also have a big event once per year? They're like, nah. Yeah, very confusing. Yeah. Anyway, talking about that, God knows when that's going to happen. <laughs> oh yeah. Still organizing that. Still, yeah. stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll 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 talk about the main event when we have more information about it. It's yeah. it's currently on the. Currently, work. it's in pitch and pre-production phase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I would say it's been in pitch and pre-production phase for a whole year. Uh, yeah, just that's so look, don't. Is it? No. No, no but since a few months. Uh, October, We've been working dude. very hard. October, on it. yeah. We, we want to make something good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it has uh, its ups and downs, you know. I believe that's the end of the podcast, isn't it? If it has to be, I was hoping we could just sit here in silence for another hour. <sighs> yeah. Well, yeah. it turns out we have three more podcasts to record today. Well, well, well definitely not that many. All right. Too. Anyway. Anyway, so that will be the end of today's episode. We hope you enjoyed listening. And if you want more, please feel free to subscribe and ring the notification bell. We release episodes every two weeks. And if you want any more additional information about the podcast or the event, be sure to check out our Instagram linked in the description below. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye, guys. See you.